Welcome. Thanks for being with us. I'm Dan Haggerty. They are the ordinary people. Maybe your neighbors, your friends, or someone you've never met. People who decided to dedicate their lives to serve the community and the world. Veteran KGW reporter Pat Doris brings us profiles of those who have heard the call to service and on a moment's notice will find themselves anywhere help is needed. We're going to start now with two stories. A third generation fighter pilot stationed in Portland who is part of the frontline defenses of our nation. Then the story of a Salem based Black Hawk crew who fought the inferno of the California fires. You've likely seen them in the skies around Portland, maybe even heard them a time or two. The F-15s stationed at Portland's airport are the aerial cops for the entire Northwest. That's all I've ever wanted to do. The fighter pilot who leads the squadron is Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Rutgers IV. Yeah, I've always wanted to be a pilot. He comes from a long line of military pilots, dating back to the early days of flight with his great-grandfather, James Norman Hall. <laughs> My great grandfather had a lot of interesting experiences. So fought for in World War I for three countries, the British, the French, as well as the Americans, and, and uh, was able to fly as one of the first aviators in the U.S. Army. Hall was a world explorer and an author. You might have heard of one military classic he co-wrote, Mutiny on the Bounty. I'm very proud and honored to, to be part of the lineage that I have, basically 100 years of aviation. His grandfather flew in planes as a gunner. His father flew turboprop planes and later a helicopter for the military. It's no surprise then that Lieutenant Colonel Rutgers ended up right here. Well, often we don't. And just like in Top Gun and other pilot movies you've seen, the pilots here have unique nicknames or call signs. Lieutenant Colonel Rutgers is Stitch. I tried to learn the story behind that. Our call signs are usually given to us when there's something uh, associated with buffoonery or a spe specific instance that someone can poke fun. It yeah. creates kind of a sense of belonging to the tribe, the organization, and we take pride in our, our call signs. Do you not want to tell us what it was? I do not want to tell you <laughs> what my name came from. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> when they are on alert status, which can last as long as 72 hours, they live inside this building behind barbed wire. They're basically stuck here. It's sort of like being a firefighter, except you never get to run out to the store. They are just steps away from their jets, which are gassed up and loaded with weapons. The weapons on board are hot, so sensitive, we were not allowed to bring our cell phones near the jet out of fear that our frequency might trigger something. So when you're on alert, you're literally here. Yeah, we don't leave this facility for 24 to 72 hours that we're on an alert shift. So our response is to be airborne with the klaxon going off within about five minutes. Because they're stuck here so long, they have comfy chairs and of course a kitchen and yes, movies. Yep, we saw that title too. There's a gym over there, we work out, uh, sleep when required. And watch a few movies. Watch a few movies if we can, some <laughs> KGW uh, when required as well. There so, you go, of course. Yeah. Because you want to stay informed. Absolutely. And you might as well watch the best. We need to know what's going on. He may have politics in his future. What you might not know is that the F-15s have a very serious mission. They are the only fighter jets in the Northwest. They cover territory that stretches from the Canadian border down to Northern California. They are constantly training for action, including intercepts of Russian bombers. They took these pictures in the air in 2012, 2014, and 2015. Just did a loop -de -loop. And remember the man who stole the airliner and flew it around Seattle recently? It was the Portland-based fighters who roared up there to make sure he did not threaten the city. It's kind of a, a humbling responsibility to be given that trust to, to do this important mission and in effect protect the Pacific Northwest from whatever threat that may exist out there. Away from the military, Rutgers has a full life. He's married, and yes, there is a son, possibly a fifth-generation serviceman. Will he be a pilot, too? I've got a 14-month-old son. Congratulations. So we'll see if uh, he is, who knows, you know, the future in 2030, if there's still going to be manned aircraft that require a pilot. But we definitely take him flying. We've got a little plane out there, and he's been all over the country. And, and as far as I can tell, he enjoys it so far. So.
We're on board an Oregon Blackhawk helicopter in Northern California. This video from a crew member's phone shows the smoke and flames the chopper will dance with for nearly two weeks. It is amazing to fly next to like a 150 foot wall of flame. That's, that's kind of within a several hundred yards. It's, 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 an, it's an amazing experience. That's Chief Warrant Officer 3, Josiah Ziner, one of two pilots on board. He's been flying choppers 12 years. A lot of times we would help the fire would jump the fire line, and so that's when we would have to come in and try to slow the fire down. So those were a lot of the areas that we helped out with. The crew flew from Salem to California last August for what was called the Stone Fire. Lightning sparked it between Klamath Falls and Redding. It would eventually grow to nearly 40,000 acres. It was absolutely amazing. Captain Joseph Wilson is the other pilot. He said even though it looks a bit harrowing, Dipping for water with other helicopters at the same time was relatively routine here. It's very busy, lots of aircraft. There were, at uh, I think one point we had four or five helicopters working in the same general vicinity. Wilson and Ziner always wanted to fly. Wilson followed an unusual path. He didn't join up until he was 30 years old. He needed help paying off student loans, so off he went. Wilson feels pulled to serve others, his family, and the disadvantaged teens he works with full time at a job corps site on Mount Hood. And my boss is very understanding, so he, he knows that when the guard calls, I'm supposed to answer, yeah. and he's supportive of my enthusiasm to serve. This past summer, the people of California needed help. That's the best part. Uh, you know, we joined the guard because we want to help and we want to serve, and we serve the people of the United States here and abroad and everywhere in between, so uh, when somebody in need calls, we answer. Sometimes the calls take them far away, the unit spent all of 2017 in Kuwait flying medical missions for the Army. It was amazing that our families uh, let us go again for two and a half weeks to go to California because they were just without us for all of 2017. Fighting fire with a military helicopter and heavy bucket of water underneath is not for the faint of heart. Sometimes a fire has a mind of its own, so we're just, hey, you, you stay right there. We're going to drop some water on you. It'll be okay. <laughs> we need you to slow down a little bit. So. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't, so. Yeah. The crew from Company G, 189th Aviation Regiment, was the only Oregon Guard Black Hawk helicopter sent to California in the summer of 2018. They flew 68 missions and dropped more than 76,000 gallons of water, all in the service of others. Welcome back to our special presentation, Those Who Serve. Our next story is about one woman who was trapped on top of a mountain with life-threatening injuries and the helicopter team that rescued her from the air. Their lives are now connected, and we were there as they met for the first time since that terrible day. It's a story of service and gratitude. Here again is Pat Doris. Just above the treetops, an Oregon Army National Guard Blackhawk dives and banks along the drainages of Mount Hood. The pilots fly their $6 million machine like a race car in the sky. There's no denying the thrill in it. It is a blast. It is a ton of fun. It's more than a joy ride, though. This crew could be called up to active duty overseas where the maneuvers help them dodge bullets while they pick up injured soldiers. This day, the mission is also focused on training for backcountry rescues. which is why we landed and got out. We're in the foothills of Mount Hood where the helicopter crew has a landing zone. They use this for training. So you can see the paramedic has got the basket here. They're practicing the hoist so that when they really need it, they can do it almost without thinking. Josh Spohr is a paramedic in his full-time job. He's also a paramedic in the Oregon National Guard. Yeah, I think I've always had that, that niche to, to try and help people. And uh, I think I found it here. Which is good for everyone involved. Just ask Sarah Rask. I enjoy climbing rocks, I guess you could say. Sarah found herself on the edge of a steep pitch near the top of Broken Top Mountain in Central Oregon last July. It just, and it was just like, I'm at 9,000 feet and this rock is no longer attached to the mountain. Like, terrifying moment for me. She jumped back and landed unhurt on a steep slope below. 
But then she saw the big rock tumbling down right at her. And it's collided with my back and it kind of shot my legs out in front of me and just squished me right in half. The call went out for help. Her partner and other hikers comforted Sarah as they waited for rescue. I did have mobility in my legs, doctors say, less than an inch different, two centimeters and I would, have, I would have never walked again. This picture taken from inside the Black Hawk that day shows Sarah, a tiny dot in orange there to the right, stuck on a narrow ledge. It took hours, but finally she heard the Black Hawk. Oh my gosh, yeah, I could have cried. It hovered, and then someone in green was lowered on the hoist cable. I watched my <laughs> knight in shining medic gear just come down from the helicopter. It was paramedic Josh Spore. The Black Hawk flew away, waiting nearby until needed. Spore teetered on the edge of Sarah's ledge with no safety line. And I'm just like, if this man <laughs> falls off this mountain, I don't know what, what I <laughs> like. It was just, it was a terrifying thought that kept reoccurring. But he didn't fall. And just like we saw in the training, the chopper returned and Sarah was hoisted up to safety and flown to the hospital in Bend. Every mission has its unique aspects. Um, it's not just another mission. Um, Hers was especially uh, dangerous, I guess. It was a really uh, narrow shelf that she was on, and there was other rocks that could have fallen on her. As the hoist operator in back, Landon Gross, has seen the relief up close several times. You could see the stress and everything off their chest, like the big exhale, and like, I was safe. And so it's a pretty good feeling when, when you get to be a part of that. It's also a good feeling. Look at you. Good to see you. To see the patient again. Good, how are you feeling? Excellent. Yeah, how's yeah. the back? Getting better every day. Yeah. We were there when Sarah returned and met her paramedic and pilots. I'm so glad to see you walking. Yes, thank you. Ha <laughs> ha, my medic. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Saving lives. They shared pictures bonded by the incredible experience of the rescuers and the rescued. To be able to go out and do search and rescue and save lives, I think, there's nothing better than that. I love getting to meet the, the folks who come back um, and uh, get a chance to talk to them and learn their stories um, because otherwise we just see it from, from our side um, and I like seeing the, the whole story. Sarah liked it too. Are you gonna take off soon? Maybe more than they'll ever know. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for those, for those guys, for sure. Certainly good to know that that crew is nearby, ready to respond. So coming up, when Hurricane Harvey inundated Texas, it became a national emergency. The call to action was a Coast Guard team from Astoria who met that challenge and saved lives. Their story is next. Welcome back. I'm Dan Haggerty. Hurricane Harvey brought historic floods to one of America's biggest cities, and suddenly thousands were in peril. And before that rain even stopped, a Coast Guard crew from Oregon was scrambled into service. Here is their amazing story and how that experience has changed how they see the world. Hurricane Harvey hit Texas in August of 2017 as a powerful Category 4 monster. The stats are as impressive as they are awful. The storm spread 280 miles wide. Some winds hit 130 miles an hour. Damage totaled $75 billion. Roughly 30,000 people were forced into temporary shelter. As the worst of it raged, Coast Guard members from Astoria flew to Texas to help. Getting off of the C-130, uh, initially getting just blasted by all the, the rain going sideways and the wind, it was absolutely overwhelming. Lieutenant Kyle Murphy found himself near Houston in some of the worst weather he'd ever seen. Kind of mixed feelings because you want to, like you're intimidated by the situation, but you want to get out there, you want to get in the fight. They went into action the next day. Daniel Wilson, a rescue swimmer who grew up in England, said the early effort felt overwhelming. Because as soon as you got out there, you, you got to your one location for that case, and they were just surrounded by people that needed help. So we got to work. Wilson and the other rescue swimmers wore the Coast Guard's short orange wetsuits. He captured some of the moments with his GoPro camera. Once you came to one house, somebody else two or three houses down was waving a towel. You'd go to the next house. Um, often there were a lot of pets as well because they're all part of their family. So you'd sometimes hoist a family with two or three pets. And here's something we don't think about. That cable lowering the rescue swimmers, it often shocked them when they touched it. 
the static that gets built up by the helicopter, uh, you have a, a cable that, that discharges that. Uh, but more often than not, uh, there was so much around that you'd, you'd be getting shot quite often. Lieutenant Trip Hayes, a pilot, has family in Houston. He was eager to help, but remembers thinking he needed more of everything. It is the overwhelming sense of, I don't have enough fuel for this, I don't have enough time for this, I don't have enough space in the back of this aircraft. Um, well, it's not that we don't, but just you have, you want more, you want to help more. Supplies were tight and rescue calls came in fast. Hayes wrote the coordinates of his very first mission on the side of this cup. As the emergency calls dwindled, they were able to fly around and look for those who still needed help. It led them to a compound of trailers that Murphy, a pilot, will never forget. We look at the houses around us and there is a Confederate flags and everything just on the houses themselves and they were flying Confederate flags and uh, uh, and when the swimmers went out, they were greeted by two guys with uh, swastikas tattooed on their, their necks. Murphy waited in the chopper on the ground as the swimmers went to get a man with serious medical problems. It gave him time to think. I mean, it was amazing at that point to see that these people were willing to set their hatred aside to be saved. It just brings me back down to just what we believe, no matter our divisions, no matter what's going on in the country, you either have air in your lungs or you don't. And when we see people on their worst days, it doesn't matter. Like, life is life. And, I mean, that's why we all joined the Coast Guard, was to help each other out and help others out, no matter what they believe, no matter who they are. If you were to talk to Angela Owen a few years ago, she would have told you that she had a good life, but not one that brings her fulfillment. So she made a change. And now you'll find her on the front lines of disasters around the world, bringing help, hope, and healing. It's not always an easy task. There are challenges that even she struggles with, but it's her call to help people who are in need when the world falls apart that gives her life purpose. Angela Owen has traveled the world with the supplies in this black bag. It carries nearly everything she needs to travel the globe on 72 hours notice. I never bring all of this stuff, but all of it's key in different locations. She's a senior program officer for Mercy Corps, working in strategic response and global emergencies, which means she needs to be ready. But it's fast. And you ask, what's it like when the call comes? It's very fast. She packs two passports yes, and an immunization card. Because if you don't have your immunizations listed, they either don't let you in the country or they give you a shot there in the airport. And you don't want either one of those things. She also has an official ID that includes her blood type. Oh, yeah. O yeah. positive. Mm -hmm. Just in case. Just in case. She and her passport have traveled to China. <laughs> Indonesia, Myanmar. Yeah, that one's hard to get. And more. Uh, let's see. Then Nepal. That was after the earthquake. Mm. It wasn't always this way. Angela started her uh, professional life in advertising. Yeah. A mistake yeah. for her. After being in advertising it for 10 years, uh, we just were burnt out on the corporate world and made a radical change in our lives to join the Peace Corps. And after volunteering and helping people while also helping ourselves, uh, we just got hooked on it. She joined Mercy Corps 11 years ago, helping with logistics for those in the field. And then the devastating Haiti earthquake of 2010 hit. I set up a futon right there because I would get up at 4 in the morning, go to work, and then I'd be home by 8 or 10. PM? Mm-hmm. Long days. Yeah. She long. loved it and, I mean, and eventually moved into field work herself. In 2015, Angela traveled to Greece to help set up a new office and work with the refugee crisis there. And so we'd take a car and we'd drive and uh, give them high energy biscuits and water and juice for the kids. And we found out they loved oranges and they were in season, so we did that. She said the refugees had to walk two miles to register in the new country. Under government rules at the time, foreigners like Angela were forbidden to give refugees rides. Doing so would have gotten her kicked out of the country. They'd show up. Uh, one woman showed up, she must have been eight months pregnant. And I'm like, I can't give you a ride into town. I told her all about the buses and 
hooked her up with some volunteers who were Arabic speaking. A Greek person could, but I couldn't. Three years later, it still hurts. Yeah, that was tough. There are other memories, traveling to Nepal early in 2015 to help with training after the devastating earthquakes there. It's a little different than Oregon. It's a little different than Oregon. It's a little different than any place else I've ever been. She remembers the aftershocks. And I rushed to the bathroom, which was the best door frame, and I realized I'm surrounded by glass and I'm in my bare feet. So after that, the shoes were by the bed and my arm was always looped through that strap. She was amazed at the destruction and the belief of the people. It was pretty impactful, but also uh, when you see that kind of devastation, you're seeing all these people just pitching in and helping and stacking bricks from something that's been destroyed in anticipation of rebuilding it. So at the same time there's tragedy, there's also a lot of hope. Which is what keeps her coming back for more. The ability to help people at their lowest point in life. This past October, she flew to Florida to help after Hurricane Michael leveled much of the panhandle. And she's ready for whatever the next adventure brings. It's interesting because when you meet new people in a different location, you think, wow, people all over the world are wonderful. They're also wonderful right next door. (laughs) You just have to take the time and get to know them. People are wonderful all over the world. And if you know someone whose story deserves to be told, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at mykgw at kgw.com. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you to all those who serve.